Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of our uh, virtual STEM classrooms. Uh, my name is Johnny Canale. I'm OSearch's communications manager. Uh, joining me today, I have Dr. Carly Newton uh, from the Wildlife Conservation Society and our OSearch education ambassador, uh, Jen Cotton, who's going to be leading today's class. Uh, this week, we are partnered up with uh, COSTA. Actually, we're always partnered up with COSTA. But today, this week in particular, uh, they are helping us put on uh, a week's worth of, or a couple days worth of classes on microplastics. Um, and Dr. Newton is uh, the veterinarian who's on the lift with us anytime we have a shark. And so she's also doing studies that focus on the overall health of white sharks um, and so she's going to speak to us a little bit about how microplastics are uh, being found in sharks. And Jen Cotton, who is our wonderful education ambassador, is going to be leading the class. She's put together this whole presentation. Uh, and we are just so excited to have both of you here today. How are you guys? Doing well. How are you? Good. Doing well. Good. Well, I think with that, oh, one quick thing, guys. Looks like some of you are possibly having some issues seeing anything. Hang on, let me see what might be going on here. Let's see. Bear with us, guys, real quick. I'm seeing, so I did want to mention there is a comment section right below this video where I encourage you guys all to leave questions throughout the presentation if it makes uh if I need to, I will interrupt you whoever's presenting and ask them that question. Otherwise, I'll try and save them all to the end. The more on, top, on topic your question is, the better chance you'll have of um, being able to... Okay, the video is not loading. Give me one sec to try and understand what's going on here, guys. Hang on. Sorry, this is all live, so we are trying to roll with the punches. Hang on. Oh, I see what happened. Okay, stand by. Hang on it. Hang on, everyone. Hang on, everybody. I'm working here. Sorry. What is going on?
What the heck? My friend said they can't hear or see anything. Yeah, it's it's uh, it was working. I, I I'm blown away about what's going on. It it's working on my side. Um, hang on, they we're still live on YouTube though, so hang on. Okay. I don't understand. There we go. All right, we're back. We're up. You can see it now? I got the all good now from the person I know watching. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for being patient with us. Uh, it was all working, obviously. Technology is a tough thing sometimes, but I appreciate you all being very patient with us while we solve whatever was going on. Like I said, we had it all dialed in. Let me reintroduce uh, everybody um, since many of you were uh, not able to see the beginning. Um, yeah, joining us today, we have our education ambassador, Jen Cotton, um, who's been helping, doing an amazing job for the past couple of weeks doing these uh, uh, virtual classrooms. Uh, and we also have Dr. Harley Newton from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, she is the veterinarian who is on board when we have the sharks on, monitoring their health, making sure they're safe. She's also doing some awesome studies that have to do with the overall health of white sharks. Um, and so that means she knows a little bit about uh, microplastics, which is the topic of today's uh, e-classroom. So uh, since we're already running a little bit late, Jen, I will turn it over to you to get things kicked off. Again, thank you everybody for, for sticking around with us. Sure, so hi everybody, thank you for joining us today. We're just gonna go ahead and get right into it. So John, if you can do a couple of clicks where it says what are microplastics. Um, few slides over. So we're going to start by introducing what a microplastic actually is. Um, so you can see here three different samples. So we have um, the top, which has some blue material in it, which is um, some type of microplastic. We have 
Do some samples with some fish, uh, juvenile fish within it, and then what looks like some um, seaweed within the other sample. So these samples are taken from the same area. We're able to separate it out, and we find these little bits of plastic. So those plastics are what we could, would consider a microplastic. So that's any plastic that's five millimeters or smaller. Um, five millimeters is about 0.2 inches, or if you have a little pencil, you know, the eraser on it, it's smaller than that. So they're really tiny um, and they're hard for us to um, pick out within the ocean, which is part of the problem. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna look at where these actually come from. So now you know how big they are. You know, most plastic that you see is not that big. We have larger things like plastic water bottles, straws, bags, um, utensils, so like forks and spoons that are plastic all of those will eventually end up as microplastic if they're not removed from the environment. So they are large pieces that are broken down over time. So they either weather down um, to where they become these microplastics or they will go through a process of photo, uh, where they photodegrade. So they break down because of the sun. Um, so Harley's actually been out on quite a few expeditions a lot of expeditions actually. So Harley, can you tell them any types of plastics that you may have seen on your expedition? Sure. So what we're talking about today are microplastics. So they're really the plastic you can't see, but they do start out as these big plastics, the, the macroplastics. So the type of things that we see um, include things like, like Jen mentioned, things like bottles, um, also fishing gear, fishing gear is another big problem, a, a type of plastic that can get left in the oceans. We see a lot of balloons. Um, you know, for me as a veterinarian, that's probably one of the more unfortunate items as a macroplastic because it's the type of item that um, bigger animals will accidentally eat. But all these things eventually do break down and become these microplastics that we're gonna talk about today. All right, so yeah, like you said, there's balloons. You know, I've, I've been on the water and I'm seeing milk jugs floating around like it, it's just endless how many pieces of plastic are out there um so on the next slide we'll look at some some samples that have actually been collected from individuals um that we know um and i've actually seen some of these firsthand so the um image in the middle is the bottle that we found floating around on top of the sea surface so that was picked up on an expedition and you can see all of the life that has grown on it um so it's been around for a long enough for all of those organisms to make it a home. Um, on the top left, that was taken down in Mariana's Trench, which is one of the deepest parts of the ocean. And you can see it just littered with plastics. On the bottom left, those are called nurdles. So we have shipping vessels that will bring these tiny little round pieces of plastic that are in this shape so that they can be shipped easily and then melt down and created into other items. So they'll be shipped across the sea to places where they can manufacture them into items that we'd use around the house. So those nurdles escape from shipping containers pretty often and can be found washed up on a bunch of beaches. Those specific ones that you're seeing in that bottom left image were picked up on the beaches of Cornwall, England. So they have been just everywhere. The um, top right, that was a sample that was picked up in Antarctica. So somewhere that has very, very, very few people still has evidence of, of microplastics in the samples that are picked up there. The bottom right, that's actually where I live. That's Cocoa Beach um, area. And you can see littered all along where the waves wash up during low tide. There's a ton of little pieces of plastic. In fact, it's so much that I've had students of mine out with me on the beach picking up these little plastics. And we spent a solid hour in a very, very small area. Um, also at the rack line, which is where the high tide meets um, the top of the sand, and a bunch of seaweed washes up, there's a ton of plastics up there as well. So you really can't take a step at the beach anymore without walking onto microplastics. Um, Harley, you're up in the New York area. Is that something that you see if you ever make it over to the coast over there? Yeah, unfortunately it is something that we see. Um, there's also, you know, smaller particles that we see on the, the beach that some people call mermaid's tears, which are just tiny little polished pieces of plastic of different different colors. But yeah, we very much see a lot of the same things up here in New York. 
Um, and something you know, I meet here in Florida. So when we have hurricanes come through um, and those large that storm surge, the amount of plastic that washes up is you can't even comprehend it. Um, it's just everywhere, and it's items that you don't even know where they came from. I, I've done a walk after Hurricane Matthew to try and do some of the cleanup to get it before it goes back into the ocean. And we've had pieces, large pieces of plastic with, with writing that was in a completely different language that I didn't even know what, what language it was or couldn't even begin to understand where it came from. So that's another problem is we don't know exactly where these materials are coming from. It's just kind of coming from everywhere. So it's a, it's a global issue. Um, and it's something that we're going to look at with the marine food webs here on the next slide. So, John, if you can click, please. So we're going to look at the effect on the marine food web. Um, so the basic part of this is that the organisms will ingest it and they have plastic in their bellies and it can take over the space that normally would be taken, you know, used for food. Um, we have little baby sea turtles in my area that come up and they're sick and then and, and end up passing away. And then when they do a necropsy, which is what they do with the little turtles, and they'll find bellies full of plastic and just tiny little bits of the sargassum seaweed, which is what you're seeing in this image. And that's their normal food source. So the little plastics are really just overtaking their natural diet. Um, a huge issue are the toxins that can actually adhere to the plastic. So like you have a paper towel, if you spill some juice on the ground, you want to clean it up, that paper towel is going to suck up that juice. The plastic's kind of doing that with toxins. Um, and Harley really, that's really what she's kind of looking at is, is the blood and the impact on that marine food web. Um, so Harley, would you like to, you know, kind of explain to them a little bit more about that? Sure. So when we talk about the, the food web, we basically talk about the fact that, you know, tiny things get eaten by slightly bigger things that eat, get eaten by slightly bigger things um, as we progress along the way. And the thing about microplastics is, is that they're so small, um, these tiny organisms that are at the very base of, of the, the food web, you know, little invertebrates, um, even phytoplankton wind up eating these plastics. And once they're inside of those organisms, it does impact their health. But on top of it, the next thing that eats them also takes in those plastics and accumulates those plastics. And if those plastics have toxins on them, they accumulate those toxins as well. And those are the things that can really start um, impacting the health of higher vertebrates in the system or, you know, bigger animals as we move up that web. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Another issue with that is um, it's just that buildup of those toxins over time. It just amplifies as the organism gets bigger, right? So that concentration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So these smaller organisms are filter feeders. So they will just pull in water and pull out um, what they think is food items. And they wind up being plastics that have toxins. And then those toxins become concentrated in those organisms. So they kind of, you know, just sort of fill up with kind of this um, not really um, good center of stuff that the next animal then eats and then gets a big dose of that toxin. Uh, um, so on the next slide, we're actually going to look at how that impacts sharks. So Harley, I'm going to have you go ahead and take the lead on this one since this is your primary work. Yeah, sure. So um, we're really just sort of at the beginning um, phases of trying to understand how um, these microplastics might be um, affecting sharks. Um, we know that lots of different organisms and you know fish, which sharks eat, um, can accumulate microplastics. Um, and we know that other you know larger organisms can accumulate them. The first shark species where people really found microplastics were the two biggest ones that we have, which are basking sharks and whale sharks. And that's because they're filter feeders. So they, like I was talking about before, will filter water and pull in all these particles and food items, but on top of it are pulling in plastics. So there's been this movement to try and understand whether by eating fish and other prey items, if big predators like sharks are also accumulating these types of items. So the work that we're doing with the white sharks, um, an easy way to try and figure out whether these animals are um, taking in microplastics as part of their diet is by looking at their poop. So we uh, take a sample when we have them on the lift um, and then we process it and we look for these types of particles in it. 
Um, the things that we're trying to understand is um, whether there's plastic um, in the poop, so therefore that's been eaten by the animal. Then we want to identify, you know, decide what kind of plastic it is. So you can have those little tiny fragments identified so you know what they came from. And then we can have them looked at to see what kind of toxins are on there. And that's where we really get a sense of how these microplastics might be harming the animals. Now, I also, on top of that, um, collect blood samples. So, you know, basically like when your dog or cat goes to the vet, I take a blood sample and I look at it and I'm looking for signs of illness that might be related to toxin exposure. So that's kind of how everything all comes together to understand whether or not they're being exposed to plastics and then also how it's um, impacting their health. Right. The next slide should have maybe some pictures. Oh, so what, there you go. Yeah. So I did talk about kind of the impacts. And like I said, we're still kind of in that early stage. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, we've sampled a number of different white sharks all along the Atlantic coast. And every single shark that we have a sample from, we've been able to find um, plastic fibers. So these are, are those examples. And you see um, in the top left, you have this little black fiber. And then in the bottom middle, you have this red fiber. And then in the top right, um, this is actually kind of a cobalt blue fiber. And again, it didn't matter what age the shark was. It didn't matter what region, you know, what part of the Atlantic Ocean we were in. All of them had these fibers. So what questions do we still need to answer? So we have the fibers. Um, we need to send them off um, so that we can get them identified. Like I said before, um, you know, we want to know what type of plastic it is um, that we're seeing in the sharks so we know where it's coming from. Um, and then we also want to know if there's any toxins associated with them. Once we know those sort of two questions, we can compare um, how much um, plastic we're seeing in the animals and the types with other changes in the animal, like if there's any changes in their blood. And next week, um, you'll be having classes with Lisa Crawford, and she actually studies toxins um, in sharks. Um, so it's linking all those things together. So she can actually tell you whether those toxins that are attached to the plastics are potentially in the sharks. So those are all questions that we're still working on. Um, in your study so far, because you've done uh, sampling on the young of the year all the way up to, you know, a very large adult white shark, have you noticed any differences in the size of the shark versus the levels of these fibers that you're finding? No, I mean, we're, we're collecting very small um, samples. Um, so we weren't at the point where we were seeing how much plastic is present. Um, but we're definitely seeing it in all the samples. There wasn't a single sample that I didn't um, process that I wasn't able to come up with an easy source of fibers. They were not hard to find. It's not like they were rare. Great, so um, on the next slide, please, John. So one question we had asked with this issue is, what can you do to help? Um, the plastic problem is a massive global issue however everyone can kind of do their part and if everybody started doing their own part we can really start putting a dent on this issue and and have hopes for you know remediating it soon um so there's some things that you could do like you can work with organizations and help such such as organizations like osearch and um help the people that are actually doing the research um you know, Harley's at New York Aquarium, so those are great places that you can go visit and, you know, and see the work that they're doing there and participate. Um, and then just using reusable items at home is really the easiest thing that you can do. So, you know, you see uh, Max here, he's, he's one of our crew members, he's using a reusable water bottle. So he's got a Yeti that he's using instead of a single use plastic water bottle. Um, I have a water for me today and it's in a, to go cup as well um so it's stainless steel you know no plastic um so there are just a lot of ways that you can cut back in your own life um so a reusable water bottle reusable bags reusable straws are a really big one those are all very very easy switches that you can make at home reduce reuse recycle and i want you to notice that recycle is that last word in those uh in that three word statement um, reduction really is key 
So reduce that amount of single-use plastic that you are using. Um, reuse. So if you must use, you know, a plastic bag, if you can't get out of it or it's the only thing you have on you, that's okay from time to time. But find a way to reuse that bag. You know, don't just throw it away. Make sure you, make sure it goes for another purpose. Or even plastic water bottles. We've done so many different art projects using plastic water bottles as a way to reuse them. And there's a lot of them out there that you can look up as well. And then recycle. Make sure you guys are recycling the items that are able to be recycled. Not everything can be, so just uh, make sure you're mindful of which ones you are recycling um, and get those in the right uh, disposal areas. And then the last thing, and one of my favorite ways to help, is to organize a beach, river, road cleanup. You know, if you don't live by the ocean, go to your backyard or your neighborhood. See what's out there because you'd be very surprised the amount of plastic that's out in the roads. And we've discussed in a few other areas, but everything that's out in the environment on land will eventually make its way to the sea if it's not managed properly. So go out there and clean up with your friends and family. You know, that's something fun you can do. While we're all stuck at home, you can still go for a walk. Um, so go ahead and clean up. And that's another way you can reuse those plastic bags is use them as a way to do a cleanup. Um, so with that, we actually on our next slide have a little activity that you can do to be a little more mindful of the choices that you're making. So we're going to look and see about doing a litterless lunch challenge. Um, and we can expand on that throughout the week that I'll tell you at the end. So with this, we're going to challenge you to participate in trying to have a litterless lunch. So this is something that's a lot easier to do now because we're home all the time. But if you know you get to go items, it becomes a little more challenging. So you're going to see how much trash or litter you accumulate in your lunch. So if you get takeout, you know, that's usually in a container that is considered litter. So see how much you're using in your lunch on a daily basis. Every day you're gonna take a tally while you make your lunch or so using a plastic knife or using a plastic spoon or are you using those reusable options. So start taking a tally of how much you're, you're using. And if you are using those single use items, can they be recycled and which ones can be? Um, and then each day, you know, try to make those mindful decisions on how to make your lunch um, to see if you can get one that's eventually completely litterless. Um, you know, even something as far as making a sandwich, you know, you're, there's a bag for the bread and a bag for your, you know, the lunch meat, all of those things add up over time. So something we've done in my classroom is I've had kids carry around a bag to collect their plastic throughout the entire week so we can kind of see who's using what and then they were then able to make some better choices as far as um, how they're making their lunch and how they're carrying it. So it was it was pretty eye opening. So we challenge you to do that and let us know how you do with your your litterless lunch. Um, so I think with that, we're going to open it up to some questions, if anybody has any. Yeah, thanks, guys. I do have, there were a lot of great questions coming in as you guys were talking. So uh, if you have any more, please use that comment box down below to ask them. Um, but there were definitely some good ones that I want to bring up to you guys. Um, starting with maybe a simple question, and maybe there's an answer, or maybe there's not, but, you know, and either one of you can take this. Why, why do people dump uh, trash into the ocean? I don't know that they're specifically dumping. Some people are doing things like that, but it, for the most part, it's stuff that's just entering into the waterways in another way. Um, so if someone throws a bottle out their window of their car and they're littering, that's not necessarily them throwing it into the ocean, but it can make its way to the ocean. Um, there's been a lot of instances with storms where they've just run off these items into the sea or other waterways. So I don't think it's a lot of it's not directly just I'm going to take all of my trash and throw it right into the ocean. A lot of it's just indirectly kind of filtering its way there. Uh, there are a few instances, you know, when you Harley brought up balloons, and that's kind of a sore spot for both of us. When you yeah. Those balloons, they have to come down and, and the ocean 70% of our planet. The, the opportunity for it to go into the ocean is, is very large. So it's just kind of, I think, just makes its way there for the most part. I mean, what do you think, Carly? Yeah, I mean, I spend most of my summer doing field research on the ocean. And sometimes we spend most of the day taking tallies of the numbers of balloons we recover. Mm -hmm. 
something that Jen said I think is important. You know, when we talk about plastic trash, if you see plastic trash, it's going to eventually wind up in the ocean. Find a way to pick it up. Find a way to get it where it's supposed to be. It's the simplest thing you can do, but it's really important. I think you would be surprised if you go do a walk of your neighborhood and actually pay close attention to what's around, how much is, is just sitting on the in the grass of your neighborhood. Yeah, and I do encourage everyone to do that litterless lunch. You know, there's a lot more options these days in choosing whether or not you receive plastics, like particularly if you're getting takeout, you can tell people you don't want them, you can tell them that, you know, you don't want the plastic bag. And in New York City, um, you know, it used to be there were some places that you could even take your own containers. So they do options out there. We can bring containers and they'll put it in there for you. Mm -hmm. Another good question is we're talking a lot, or obviously the title of this um, is microplastics, but are, are, is there more than just microplastics out there? Are there other sizes of plastics that are a problem? Yeah. So, I mean, Jen talked about there's three, basically three different types of plastics people talk about. Um, the macroplastics, like I said before, are the ones that you can see with your eye. And those are the pictures that Jen showed of the, you know, the degraded bottles and the things that are floating and out there. The microplastics are the ones that we talked about that are, you know, less than five millimeters. So you can sort of see them with your eye if you're really looking for them. Um, but they get even smaller than that. And there are now um, particles that people call nanoplastics. These are super, super tiny. You can only see them with a microscope. And we're still really learning kind of how those can impact um, animals and even humans because they're so small, they can be in unexpected places. Um, and another thing that um, I meant to say earlier and didn't is that it's within the entire water column. So plastics all have different densities so it's just like if you mix oil and water together it's not going to mix really well because one's less dense than the other so plastic has different densities as well and it's through the entire water column from the very very top surface all the way down to the deep sea and it's like that all the time so it's not like it just floats and then sinks and that's the end of it it is within the entire water column as a whole so it's it's a very large scale issue with with the plastics in general, from you know those macro plastics all the way all the way down. Thanks, guys. Another uh, good question um, here is: Has there ever been a machine, or is there a way of getting this plastic out of the ocean? I know there's a couple of projects going on where they're trying to get the larger scale ones, but I have not seen anything as far as microplastic goes. Uh, I don't really know that a way to do that. I think that's a really cool research project and something that is really important to maybe have someone start looking into, but I haven't heard from microplastics. I know there's a lot of large scale macroplastic projects going on. Um, Harley, have you heard of any? Yeah, um, you know, most of what I'm familiar with are those macroplastics because they really are the source and they're an important place to target and they're making, you know, huge gyres, big accumulations in our oceans. Um, certainly, uh, most of the plastics that are coming from land actually go through our fresh, um, fresh waterways and, and some of them even go through water processing plants. So the water processing plants um, have been working to find ways to filter these plastics out, but the problem is, is that they're so small they can just evade those types of measures. So it would, you know, it's it is hard to explain when you can't see it easily with your eye, you know, how much plastic there really is kind of floating through the oceans right now. And really it's gonna be hard to get it all back out. Um, I've had a student in the past do a project looking at washing machine water. So the top load versus the front load and those microfibers that Harley brought up. And so there's a little bit of a correlation between the types of washing machine you're using and the amount of microfibers that are escaping. Um, and I know in our area here, because I live by the Indian River Lagoon, which is a huge estuary, it's one of the largest ones in the world that goes straight into the ocean. And we have what's called baffle boxes in our storm drains, and it will trap a lot of those plastics from going out, but it doesn't get everything. So there's definitely projects happening. But, you know, it's going to take a lot of effort from everyone else to just cut back as well. So another good question here is, is there a source uh, of plastic that's kind of the most common um, 
out there, like something that maybe people don't think of as being one of the leading contributors, or maybe it's an obvious answer. Like, is there one thing you can point to that started being the most one item or, or source of plastic that's the most disruptive? When I do beach cleanup, I find, I mean, it probably has a lot to do with it being on the shore where people are, but I find forks and spoons and straws, those, those kind of items the most. Uh, the microplastics are definitely the greatest out there and they're just pieces of everything. So I don't quite know, it's a lot of blues, <laughs> plastic pieces, um, but large scale, easy to pick up bottle caps, straws, forks, spoons, little tiny plastic bags, things like that. Um, the convenience items are the ones that I find the most and also cigarette butts, which are, those are just bad, right? We don't wanna be doing that. So those are out there as well. Yeah, it's the it's the single use plastics. It's the things that you have most commonly in your life that seem to be the biggest contributors, unfortunately. I know one thing, this is kind of my question. Maybe you guys know, I was kind of surprised. I didn't know all that long ago that things like the shirt, the clothes that you wear actually has more plastic in it than we think um, also. And so you do see a lot of, Harley, you showed those um, sides of the fibers. Is all of that coming off of our clothes and like the textile industry, do you think? Not necessarily. You know, I think a lot of the kind of lighter weight plastics that we talk about, like those grocery bags or, you know, other plastic bags can break down into those kind of tiny fibers as well. But yeah, even your clothing choices can impact, you know, plastics in the environment. And that's why things like natural fibers um, can be an important choice. Excellent. Thanks. And then another question. This one is for you, Harley. I don't remember who asked it, but they asked it a little bit earlier on. Um, they said that they were sad to see that so many of the sharks had plastic in them. Do we know? They asked specifically, is it, are the sharks dying? Is it killing the, the sharks? Certainly from the preliminary work that I'm doing, I don't think um, that that's the issue. You know, when you talk about tiny animals that take in microplastics, we see a lot more issues with them having so much plastic, you know, in their stomachs and their intestines that it, you know, makes it hard for them to eat. You know, our bigger questions are more like, what does sort of the long-term exposure to these plastics do to these animals and what kind of impacts are they having? And that's where, you know, following this up next week with Lisa's talks, it's really kind of the toxin exposure that comes either directly from the microplastic breaking down and releasing things or from things that are stuck to the microplastic that the animal then, you know, is taking in. And I think that's where our biggest questions are going to lie. So, you know, my, it's not so much that when I find the microplastics, I'm looking at a sick animal that's ne necessarily dying, but we're at, those are the questions we're asking. We're asking are these plastics affecting the health of the animal? Does finding this plastic mean that this animal is less healthy than an animal that's in an environment where it isn't um, taking in these types of things? And if I understand correctly, Arlie, so you can, um, I mean, unless anything is done, there's going to be more and more plastic getting dumped into the ocean. So you can look right now um, and see any potential health effects. And then down the line, you'll be able to look as more, hopefully not more plastic starts going in, but then you'll be able to sort of compare the samples over time. Is that correct? Is that how you how you sort of deduce the health problems a little bit? Yeah, one of, one of the challenges of being a wildlife veterinarian is that we don't have a lot of normals. So a lot of the research that we do uh, is aimed at trying to figure out what normal is for these animals. And in many cases, it's really just figuring out what's normal right now, because there wasn't a way to answer that question before. So the work that I'm doing now is work that I hope somebody potentially on this um, webcast is going to pick up 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and follow up and ask more questions. And you'll be able to use the normals that I set up now to ask the same question and see if those, you know, if these plastics or other um, other things in the environment are affecting these animals. So Harley, to give the kids a term, you would call it like baseline data, right? That's what you're trying to create right now? Exactly, yeah. You're trying to create um, health baselines. Mm -hmm. Cool, well, we are kind of running out of time here, everybody. I do want to thank everybody, especially our two presenters for joining, I hope that uh, 
you all picked up at least maybe one tip that we can that you can use in your own life to sort of um, you know cut back on the amount of plastic uh, that you use. Harley, Jen, do you guys have any last thoughts or comments before we we sign off? Yeah, just thank you for joining us as always, and make sure you uh, share with us how your litterless lunch is going. You can email us at education at osearch.org, or if you'd like to go to the post of this on any of our social media outlets and share your information there, that'd be great too. Yep, and I just wanted to thank everyone for being here, um, and for maybe from today on, make some little changes in your life. Cool. So uh, like Jen said, we will have more of these classes coming up. Jen's working very hard on putting some of them together. Uh, the next one I think will be on Thursday. That one will be for grades 7 through 12. Um, next Tuesday will be the next one for, for grades K through 6. Uh, and tomorrow we'll have a microplastic expert on our Facebook uh, talking live. Um, so make sure you tune into that. Um, and with that, I think, uh, like Jen said, if you have any questions, always uh, feel free to shoot them to us at education at osearch.org. We'll be more than happy to jump on and answer those questions for you. And again, thank you all for being here just by, by being a part of something like this. It means you, you know, you're already starting to take some of the steps to uh, you know help the planet, help the ocean, uh, help our earth and, and improve it so that we can be happy or help, uh, we can be satisfied with the, the oceans that we leave for future generations. So I think with that, we'll sign off. Bye, guys.